Oh. So welcome everyone uh, to the first session of the day. Uh, Miriam is going to talk about an introduction to FIRE. Uh, it's going to be take, take around 45 minutes and then at the end we'll have 10 minutes for Q&A. And I'll be walking around with the mic. Um, well, my name is Marta Smits. I'm your moderator of the day. And uh, good luck, Miriam. Thank you. So welcome everyone. Uh, so I know that Reno already asked whose uh, Dev Days event is, the f is this the first for. Um, uh, so yeah, are you all new? Who ha is here for the first time at Dev Days? Okay, yeah, I did kind of expect that because of course this is an introductory talk. So welcome everyone. Uh, I hope that I can uh, get you started with FIRE and then uh, you can go around this conference a little bit more confidently. Uh, of course, I will be here uh, for four days, so don't hesitate to come up to me after these sessions. Uh, so yeah, um, who am I? Uh, I am uh, Miriam. So let me see. For some reason, something is frozen. Ah, there we are. Okay, uh, so my name is Miriam and I work as a trainer and training coordinator at Firely. Uh, Firely, of course, uh, uh, is one of the co-organizers of this event, but we're not an event organizer. We are actually a company that works with Fire. We provide tooling around Fire and, of course, training courses. We have consultants, etc. So anything you need in your Fire endeavors, just come up to us and we'll talk about uh, solutions. Now to start, of course you know that uh, FHIR is one of the HL7 standards. So it's important to realize that HL7 provides the quality around standards, around evolving those standards. Um, everyone can actually participate in that. So if you uh, have any feedback on your FHIR standard, then uh, let us know, let HL7 know. Uh, they have working group meetings, they have working groups that discuss changes to certain parts of the specification. Uh, and uh, they do so throughout the process that, in, uh, that makes sure that you have a quality in the development of such a standard. So if you look at what HL7 offers, FHIR is not the only standard and I just have a nice timeline here where you can see they actually already started in 1986 with uh, developing standards. And maybe uh, you have used uh, healthcare standards before and you may see uh, people saying things like, yeah, we work with HL7. <laughs> What they usually mean then is HL7 version 2, where you can see in the 1980s, 1990s, that was what was developed then. And you can see all the way at the side here, 2011, is when we have uh, fire being, uh, being started. So uh, HL7 uh, also still discusses these other standards that they maintain, so it's not only FHIR that they discuss, but of course throughout this Dev Days event, FHIR is our main standard and that's what we focus on. If you look at the way that healthcare data was usually communicated uh, before fire, it was uh, based on a system where something happened and that led to pushing out of the data to other systems that might or might not be interested in that data. They would just have to consume that or see what they had to do. So, um, well, this felt a little bit old if you looked at the technologies that you see on this slide. We have HTTP, uh, we have cloud-based data and systems. Uh, we may want to query data uh, as a client rather than just waiting for the data to be pushed to us. And this is what uh, was mentioned on the podium before by Diego and Chuck, that uh, Graham, Graham Grief, uh, that he said, well, we want this open API approach, actually. We have a vision, we have a new idea of working with all of that healthcare data that we have out there. Graham Grief, you can see a picture of him in the middle here. Um, is the, one of the FHIR founders and uh, Ewald Kramer is walking around here on the left hand side you see his picture. Uh, he's my colleague at Firely, the CTO. Uh, and we have also Lloyd McKenzie from Canada. Uh, these three gentlemen, they discussed their new ideas together and that led to the standard and the reason that you are here today. 
So one of the things that I thought of was, if we have this open API approach, we can create that open API on top of the EHR where all of that data is. And then rather than having that system pushing out the data, anyone that has a client side system and is interested in maybe parts of the data can try and pull it out, but only pull out what you want to, uh, just the small bits of data that you're interested in for the use case that you are working with at that point in time rather than getting pushed a whole blob of data and needing to sift through all of that to find that little piece of information that you wanted to. So that was their idea, their new vision. Of course, from the timeline you saw, that was already their vision in 2011, uh, and we are 10 years plus uh, uh, after that. So things have, of course, evolved as well. So they thought of this new idea, and then they said we want to create a new standard, and they wanted to call it something. They didn't want to call it HL7 version 4. There was an HL7 version 3 in the meantime as well. Um, because one of the things was that this was a new standard. It's not an update of something that already existed. Yes, they took the good things out of other standards and saw how that could align with this new standard, but they created fire from scratch. So in order to come up with a name, well, they actually came up with an acronym where the F stands for fast. And um, well, if you are a developer and you know of these newer technologies, you know HTTP calls, you know APIs, you know JSON or XML, you have a low barrier of entry. So it's relatively fast maybe to get up and running with this new standard. Then the H and the I are the most important uh, letters in the acronym, healthcare interoperability. The main reason that we have a standard like this is that we can then share the data in an interoperable way. And of course, it's about healthcare data as well. Now you will hear quite a lot of the R, resources. Those are the building blocks in FHIR, resources. And that's the little bits of data, the little bits of information that we can communicate or that we can get out of systems. So FHIR resources are the main thing in the FHIR specification. And of course, well, I have another timeline here where you can see the history of FHIR. I already mentioned 2011 when they started with this new vision. Uh, and that led to a draft being published. HL7 organizes Connectathon events when you have working group meetings. Preceding the Connectathon event, you will have uh, this, uh, sorry, sorry, preceding the working group meeting, you will have a Connectathon event, and that would help uh, to, to test the approaches. So, whenever a new addition was uh, done to the fire specification, you could test it out. Uh, not only client side systems could test it out, but you can also test out servers or you could test out particular use cases. And this is still ongoing. So if you visit a working group meeting, you can also uh, 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 participate in the Connectathon event uh, preceding that uh, working group meeting. And of course, that led to changes in the standard. And right now, we are on FHIR release five. And uh, there's probably also going to be a lot of talk about FHIR versions, etc. But FHIR release five is the main uh, the, or the last uh, version that was released. You will have to check, though, when you are going to set up your project. You will want to check what you need to align with, and you would want to choose the FHIR version, the FHIR release that aligns with uh, the, the requirements of anything that you need to, uh, to work with. Most often, I will already tell you this, that will be probably release four. Uh, definitely in the US, in the regulations, uh, there is a specific mention of using FHIR for opening up your healthcare data, and then FHIR release four is the uh, standard or the version of the standard to use. So that's just something to keep in mind that you want to align with any projects that you need to work with or any uh, regulations that you need to conform to. Then uh, FHIR has some ideas behind it. One of the things was the focus needs to be on implementers. Because yes, we can create a very nice standard, but if no one is going to implement that standard, or if it's hard to start implementing a standard, it will just not get anywhere. 
So it's important to make sure that uh, we can tailor to the implementers. And of course, also that is one of the reasons that we have this Dev Days event, the Dev Developers. So uh, no, no salespersons just working with fire. Another thing that you need to realize is that the working groups, they focus on the 80% solution. And that means that when something is common to implement, say roughly 80% of systems will implement that thing, then it will end up in the fire specification. The rest will be left out, but you can still work with it. So we'll take a look at that later. Uh, I already mentioned existing technologies, mainly uh, web technologies are in focus. Uh, but also, of course, it's very important that the information has some human readable aspect. Because if you have the healthcare data and you send it as a fire uh, uh, message to a system, it would, uh, if, it, if the system cannot work with it, would be really nice if you can still put it aside in a queue, take the human readable part out of it and display it nicely to a human who can then determine whether this is actually garbage and we have to throw it away or whether there can still be something useful inside of it. So you see heavy focus in fire on that as well. And of course, well, for me, it's very nice, uh, I think always, that we have a good focus on the community. You heard a mention of chat.fire.org, which is where the fire community meets online, has discussions. You can pose all kinds of questions there. Uh, so outside of this Dev Days conference, that would be the go-to for if you have any more uh, questions. Uh, but I also have always had this idea that, and I hope you agree with me, that the fire community that is already established is welcoming. So for, especially for you newcomers new to FIRE, I hope that you can see that as well. We're working towards the same goal, all of us. We want to make healthcare better for our loved ones, for the ones we know, right? And if everyone does that, it might sound a little bit idealistic, but if everyone does that, we make healthcare better all across the globe. Uh, and that's also what I feel in the community. Yes, we are realistic as well, but we also want to be a little bit idealistic to make sure that we can do this together and they are in this together. Um, yeah, and I'm very idealistic by nature anyway. So, <laughs> um, so that's important, that community feel. Okay, let's go back to fire again. Uh, we have those fire building blocks, the resources. And you kind of can compare them with, with Lego blocks maybe. They are separate objects, standalone objects with data in them. And then we can go and connect them to form a whole network of resources. There are quite a number of fire resource types uh, by now. Uh, I heard my colleagues say around 200 the other day. I, I haven't counted them for a while. Uh, but of course, it is important to know where to find that information. So on this slide, you can see we have a resource type list. Uh, and in this list, you can see we have some foundational resource types on the top, uh, which are uh, more for tooling and things around the fire specification. And then as of that second uh, category, or the second uh, table part, we have uh, the base, the healthcare information resource types that actually contain information, for example, about the patient uh, and further down diagnostics, medication information, etc., etc. This is something that you can actually find on the fire specification. So uh, rather than showing my presentation slide further, I'll just show you the fire specification. hl7.org forward slash fire. And you get to this page. Remember that I mentioned about these fire releases? You can see on the top that this page shows you fire release five. Now, if your requirements say that you have to work with another release of fire. Fortunately, we have nice convenience buttons on the top where you can see there's page versions. And if you say we don't need release five, but want to look at the release four, you can just click on that one. Or you add uh, forward slash R4 at the end of your URL. <laughs> that can be done as well. But then you can see we get to the release four version of fire. No matter which version you actually need to work with, there will be such a, a website dedicated to that specific release. 
then you will be able to see some, some details on this first page here where uh, you can run through all of the levels of knowledge of fire until you get to the point that you actually can use those resource types. If you want the resource type list, there's this resources button at the top. Uh, it is a resource list in the release five page, I think. Uh, and this is the same slide as, uh, or the same um, view that I had on my screens, uh, on my slide, to, uh, to show you the resource type list. Now, uh, before I go back to my presentation, I'll just click on the patient resource type because I want to highlight something that I think is also very important. Each resource type page will have the similar um, uh, look and feel and, and, and similar paragraphs on it. It will always start with this scope and uses paragraph. I think it's an important one because looking at the resource type name, maybe it's a name that doesn't align with the name that you have for that same concept. Uh, or you just want to do a quick check, is this the resource type that it actually is meant to contain the data that I want to communicate? Look through the scope and usage. It will tell you what the scope of this resource type is and how to use it. And there could also be an extra paragraph, relationships and boundaries, to show you closely related other resource types. And then you can make a good determination whether your data falls into that, the use for that particular resource type or whether you have to go to another one. Then if you scroll down, you will always find this structure. And the structure is the resource type model. It will tell you which fields are available for this resource type. And then for each field, it has a cardinality, a zero for a minimum cardinality of not being present, an optional field, or a one as minimum cardinality for mandatory fields. And then the maximum cardinality is always a one or a star, a one for a single field, a star for a repeat of that field or a list or an array, however you want to call that. So with this, you can determine what you can put inside of your resource as fields in there. You can know how often that field can be present on your data. And also you see what the data type is to fill the field in with. Next to that, on the right hand side, you see a description. And again, that's also important. We don't want to misuse fields in FHIR. You read the description and then you determine the data that I have, does that fit into that field or not? If not, you don't put it in that field, there are other options. So even if you don't find your fields that you wanted to see in this resource type, uh, maybe it's not in that 80% that I mentioned, it's still possible to add your data to it without misusing any existing fields. Now these data types, I don't have a slide on that, I think, uh, so I just stick to this uh, website still. This data type, it could be a primitive data type. We all know strings and booleans and integers, etc. But it could also be a more complex data type. Uh, for example, you can uh, see that the name here says the data type is human name. The patient's name or a person's name consists of multiple parts, right? You have your uh, family name, you have your given name, things like that. Uh, so those complex types, they have more of a structure to them. If you find that such a data type is listed there and you're not familiar with it yet, it's a clickable link. So we can actually see what the structure of the human name data type is by clicking on this. And then it will jump on a data types page that's actually quite large. It will jump to the correct paragraph. And then you can indeed see the human name data type has a structure where we can fill in the family name. We have a list of given names that's possible plus some other fields. So next to looking at the resource types, I always uh, advise to also look at the data type structures for the not so primitive data types uh, with, the, with the more complex structures. So you can actually uh, take a look at that to see if your data fits in there or how you would want to format that data. Then, 
when you actually want to create your data in FHIR, uh, there are a couple of formats that FHIR uses for communicating the data. Uh, one of them is JSON, you can also use XML, uh, and there are sp specific ways of uh, creating JSON or XML that, uh, well, that, that uh, is specific to FHIR. Uh, we use XML in a specific way, or we use JSON in a specific way. There's also the turtle format for more research-oriented uh, implementations. But I have put an example patient on this slide uh, where you can see uh, how a, a resource can be filled in. We see it starts with the resource type on the top patient uh, and then we see some information in there. There are some metadata type of information uh, that could, for example, hold the last updated date, or in this case, it contains a profile URL to indicate that the data inside conforms to that particular profile. We haven't talked about profiles yet, but uh, I have another talk as well uh, later today that, uh, that goes into that. Uh, we have a human readable part, the narrative, the human readable text in there. And as you can see, there's a div inside, so we can pluck that out. It's XHTML content. We can pluck that out and display that in the content of a context of an HTML page, or maybe your application is uh, XHTML aware. So it's quite easy to, to just show that data. We can have extensions. I have another slide on that uh, in a bit. And then you see the actual data elements uh, that you can find on that resource type page that I showed you previously. Uh, so starting in this case with an identifier for the patient, there's a name on there, and well, yeah, then I ran out of a uh, slide. Uh, so. The FHIR specification actually comes with these examples as well. I've kind of modified this one a little bit, but if you look at your resource type page, there is a button to find examples. Those examples, they are valid against the FHIR uh, release that you're looking at, and they are also downloadable as a, a zip file, as JSON examples or as XML examples, depending on what you want. Now, I mentioned that 80% focus. If something is implemented in roughly 80% of cases, it will be ending up in the fire specification. But if something is not, or it's not something that is globally accepted as a normal data element, then uh, it falls into that 20% category and you will not find a field on that. For example, the mother's maiden name. Well, maybe in the US you are quite used to having a mother's maiden name in your systems. In Europe, we are not. It's, for me, it's never recorded what my mother's maiden name is. And there are other ways to find out who I am as a unique person. So, um, so that's something that's not deemed to be common. And then what we need is to use extensions. Uh, again, looking at Lego, we have all of these very, very small parts. So even if we've already built our Lego car, we could still take another extra part and then add it to our car to, well, add an extension to it. And that's the way to represent extra data that doesn't fit in any of the standard fields that you have for your fire resource. You use extensions. Well. As mentioned, there is a topic around profiling later today, which will uh, detail this a little bit further. Then, of course, once you have your data, you want to communicate it. So you would want to take a look at what the exchange mechanism is of that. You will see a lot of fire projects saying, OK, we are going to use RESTful communication for our fire uh, communication. There is, in the FHIR specification, a RESTful API description, being the contract between a client and a server-side system. Uh, and you, if you want to be FHIR compliant, have to adhere to implementing that API if you want to use REST. Uh, but it is an option, even though uh, if you have a project that requires REST, it's no longer an option for you. For FHIR, for HL7, it is an option to use REST. And if applicable, if another paradigm of exchange is, is more applicable than the RESTful paradigm, you can still choose that. And the FHIR data, you don't have to change anything to that. There are other ways to communicate FHIR without having to change the data, but then using maybe a messaging paradigm. 
So the restful uh, way of communicating is of course just similar to retrieving something from the internet. We can go to a web, uh, website, I already had prepared that, but you just type in uh, uh, an address on the URL and then you hit send and uh, uh, you get a website, like the FIRE website. Similar to that, we can retrieve FIRE resources. If you have tooling around that, uh, or have this implemented somewhere in the background, this is of course, uh, this is just an HTTP tool, uh, you can do a GET, you can retrieve data with a GET, and you'll have to know the address of what you want to retrieve. And you can see that on the top there. I did a GET for a particular patient with some kind of a GUID at the end there, a specific patient. And in the response that the server sent me, you can see the patient resource being returned to me. Of course, this looks a little bit less nice than having a nice user interface or a website presented to you, but um, uh, tooling around this, a user interface can make the fire data look nice, of course, again, rather than the raw JSON. The resource that I retrieved came from an endpoint, our fire server. So you see the fire server's URL on there. There can be a path attached to that as well. Then the idea is that you have a resource type listed uh, the resource type is always having a beginning capital letter, so patient with a capital P, or observation with a capital O. Always make sure that you do that. And then there is this logical or technical identity. Each fire resource will get an identity when it's persisted on the system. Uh, and with that identity, you can then use such a GET request as on my previous slide to retrieve exactly that specific resource Used, uh, using its identity. You can choose, if you are the server implementer, what that identity exactly looks like at the end. The only thing that I uh, ask of you is not to put any sensitive information in there. No combination of patients' names and birth dates or a social security number or something like that. Make it something that your system can work with to retrieve the data with, but not being something that people can take and have some yeah, information coming out of that that's sensitive. Because if you talk about this communication with a GET request on the network, the URL is visible to any network sniffer. That identity is important because once a resource has an identity, we can actually link up resources uh, to show that they belong together in a certain way. So my example again, we have a car here and we have a, uh, a person uh, and we can indicate on the data of the car who the owner is. In fire, if these are fire resources, it's called a reference. We have a reference from one resource to another resource to indicate that these are linked together in some way. So uh, if we talk about an observation and a patient, uh, the observation has a subject field and the subject of that observation can be that patient. And the way to link them together is using that resource identity that we had on that previous slide. And again, that would be another reason not to make that something that's sensitive because someone that retrieves the observation may not want to be able to retrieve the actual patient data, may not be allowed. So again, if you have something in the identity that's sensitive, that would kind of leak that information. But that resource identity is used to create uh, links between the resources and with that uh, you have these small building blocks in fire and we can create a whole network of those resources that would maybe form the patient's record uh, or be a, a set of uh, resources belonging together for your use case. Here's an example of uh, that observation resource that I mentioned and that subject field. And you can see the data type is called reference. Uh, behind, behind reference, you can see these parentheses and they tell you uh, a couple of resource types that are available for the reference. Fire limits the types that you can link together uh, for most of those reference type fields. So you will have to, in this case, for observation, use a subject that is one of the options that you see listed between the parentheses. 
Uh, and that previous patient that I had, well, you can see what in Jason such a subject uh, field looks like. You don't see any patient in there. The patient is not part of the observation uh, in the data. We just have that reference, just have that link. But that makes it possible to just pick out those observations that you're interested in and maybe your implementation, your application is not interested in the patient data. You just want to show uh, a graph of the, the body weight, uh, but not all of the patient's data. And then you can just pluck out these things. Also part of the uh, RESTful API in FHIR is being able to search for data. And again, we all know how to do a Google search. Uh, and you can see uh, the search part on the URL on top there. Uh, it uses uh, uh, key value pairs uh, as parameters on the URL. And actually, the Fire Search API is similar to this as well. That's why I put this one on. Uh, in this case, I have done a search for a patient, and what you can see in that uh, query part there, or behind the question mark, is that I did a search for a patient with a particular given name and a particular family name, and, well, I input my own name, so you could probably do something like that on our server as well, and get a response. In the response, rather than seeing one patient, we now see something called a bundle. Whenever you communicate a set of fire resources, you actually want to bundle them together into a bundle resource. And then inside the bundle, you have a list of entries. And well, it is not on my slide, but in the entry, you will actually see the patient resource that matches the filter that I've put on my search there on the top. So there's a difference between an actual retrieval of a single resource, the get that I did previously on a specific patient, and then this search where the outcome always will be a bundle resource that has a, a potentially has a list of patients that match the query parameters. Well, that's all described on the FHIR API, and there might be some talks about more restful communication. But also, again, if you have any questions, uh, just come up to me, and, and I will be able to show you demos, etc., whatever you'd like. Now, of course, I mentioned we want to be interoperable. Healthcare interoperability, that's one of the things in the acronym. And I have given you these resources, these building blocks. So we have building blocks. I give you this set of Lego blocks, and now I ask you to build a house. You are all going to hopefully start. Well, I don't have Lego with me, but you would start, and you would be able to show me your house. Do you think, or well, rather, who thinks that all of your houses will look the same? Oh, fortunately, no one. Uh, okay, good. No, uh, we think of a house, but your idea of a house might be slightly different than my idea, uh, or maybe completely different, because we all have a bit different backgrounds, or we all have favorite types of houses, etc. So what we still need to do, if we have a project and we want you to have a house using those fire building blocks or these Lego blocks, we need something called an implementation guide. Because the implementation guide will tell us the type of house that we are going to create and how this is built up. How do we use these fire resources together in a useful way for our project? Which resource types are used for this project? Which extras we have, extensions, maybe we have extra requirements. For example, the patient's name is a field that is an optional field, but for a project it's really important to have a name for the patient. We can actually indicate that in a profile to say the patient's name must be mandatory. So all of those things, those profiles, extensions, documentation on how we use FHIR is in an implementation guide. And now if I give you that guide and the correct building blocks, who thinks all of the houses will look the same? I see some people nodding. <laughs> you, you can raise your hand, but yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, then all of the houses, at least uh, if I did my implementation guide correctly, will look similar. And maybe you used a different color block somewhere, or, but we have a more guidance uh, with that. 
So it's important to look at the fire specification and then also take a look at implementation guides because together with the resources and data types from FHIR plus the extensions used plus constraints, those extra requirements on the FHIR resources, we get to a profile and then with the extra documentation around that we have an implementation guide. And that helps uh, make it more clear what we want to do for that particular project with FHIR. Those profiles and implementation guides, we have platforms for them. The Simplifier platform is a repository, a public repository for profiles, extensions and other fire conformance resources. Uh, you can actually also find some implementation guides there. And there's another guide uh, that is the official uh, fire.org guides uh, registry. Uh, so you see the link on this slide. And this is also where you can find a lot of implementation guides, uh, which are that documentation around how to use fire. So specifically for any implementations in the US, I would expect you to take a look at the US core implementation guide to make sure that you align with that, that you at least know what's in there. So you can then align your own projects with the details in there uh, to be mostly interoperable in the US market at least. So that is a quick introduction into FHIR, starting you off with that. Uh, you can, as mentioned, uh, walk up to me later, but you can also find me through the Whova app or give me an email if it just doesn't fit in this uh, dev days. If you have any more general questions around what we do at Firely for tooling and consultancy, etc., there's also our info email address on there. Are there any questions for me at this point in time? Oh, uh, please wait for, uh, for a bit for the, for the microphone, yeah. Yeah, uh, I saw on the slide that when you're kind of going through the structure, there was a flags column with like sigma notation and some other symbols. Yes, Could you I, just quickly go over what, what's that used for? I skipped over that flags column, you're right. Uh, there is a flags column on, uh, uh, on the, on the um, uh, on the resource type, that's this one that you saw. Uh, there are a couple of flags that you, uh, you can see on there. There's one that's the Sigma flag, uh, which would indicate that the working group has decided that that field would be part of a summarized view of the data. So you can actually ask for not the full set of data, but you can ask for a summarized view, and then you get the fields that have the Sigma flag attached to them. Another flag that you see, that's the uh, question mark, exclamation mark flag. And if you hover over it, you can actually get an explanation. I don't know, that's probably not readable here, but it says this element is a modifier element. And that means that if this field has a value, it might modify how you approach this in processing the data. Uh, active uh, is uh, taking a Boolean. So if this uh, patient has an active field that's set to false, you probably don't want to show that in an active list of patients. There is something that you need to do with that uh, resource or maybe you need to ignore it uh, because it's duplicate or entered in error or something like that. So those modifier element flags could be important for processing the data. Uh, there's one extra flag that you also will see that is an I in release four or a C in release five. For the contact field, you see that. This indicates that there's an extra rule on that uh, particular um, uh, element. Um, and uh, that rule in this case for contact says if you fill in uh, contact party information, you have to fill in at least one of four fields inside of that. Uh, but there's, uh, there's these extra rules that you can, uh, can uh, see on the, on the fire data as well sometimes that go beyond just simple cardinality constraints. Uh, the release four seems that is the normative, but there's been release five and six. When are we, when does the community plans to move to those or keep with release four for a while? Um, I expect to see release four still for a while because we do see in current projects that that is the fire release that is used. And when you start your implementation, um, you will not within half a year go uh, to a next version and then you have a cycle of how you work with your software, of course. Um, 
So for now, most of the projects will, will stick to R4. I, of course, cannot give you any timeline how long that will be. If the US comes with a regulation tomorrow to say, well, in 2026, you need to be on release five, uh, I, I don't know that, but uh, I will. Uh, I, I do see not only in the U.S. but also in Europe that most of our customers stick to release four because of the projects that are already there. Uh, you do see some countries that start anew with fire now, starting with release five because six is not finalized yet. Could still have all kinds of changes uh, that that we're not aware of as of yet. So they they either choose to. Uh, align with some other projects release four or they choose release five uh, for some extra content uh, that they need for their projects. So I don't know if that <laughs> answers your question. But Didn't we vote to move on to six and skip five? That's probably, uh, and but again, I cannot give any guarantees. Uh, I, I think that uh, is some, that something that a lot of organizations are going to do. Right now, working with R4, and then by the time the projects are actually up and running, maybe release six is there, and then you can just see if, if it's nice to uh, nicer to skip five rather than uh, than go five and then six. Yeah. yeah. Any others? Hi, uh, you, you mentioned the building blocks aspects yes. and how all the resources fit together. I'm interested in those connections and are, is there, how, how do we learn more about the particulars of how those connections best fit together and is it bi-directional, et cetera? Well, directions are always one way. So a reference will always point from one resource to another resource. And it's not always the case that there's also a, a link the other way around. That will depend on the type of uh, thing that you would want to convey. When uh, you look at your fire resources, uh, uh, so in this case patient, I'm still on there. If you look at this uh, tree structure, you will be able to see these fields that have a, a kind of a square with an arrow pointing outwards. Those are the references, uh, the reference fields. Um, so whenever um, you set up your fire project, you would want to take a look at the resource types that are involved for your project, and then you just want to make a clear picture of which fields have references. Uh, with that, and of course also with the name of the field and the description, uh, you will be able to determine what kind of a thing this reference actually conveys. Uh, so general practitioner would point to a, a practitioner that's involved in the patient's care, right? Uh, something else would not be in there. But you will be able to see the reference type and also the, the resource types that you can reference from that field um, and uh, well that will help you with with how can these resources be connected and what would that indicate it could be that you want to have some kind of uh, a, a reference between resource that's not present in the standard fields but important for you because you want to indicate that this resource is connected to that other one because of uh, in that case, you could uh, take a look at using extensions for that, creating your own extension if you have a kind of a missing link between the resources. All right, we have uh, time for one more, I guess. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? <laughs> so for uh, implementation guides, what do we see the huge difference between different implementation guides? Will there be any change in the building blocks as well, resources as well, or is it just about uh, uh, how they were built? Like what exactly the change between? Uh, for implementation guides, uh, you have uh, all kinds of different projects, all kinds of different use cases, right? So for each use case, you could have an implementation guide that describes that use case, usually having a limited set of resource types rather than the 200 plus that are in the resource type list. So as an implementer, you will know, oh, I only have to focus on conditions, observations, etc. You have a limited list usually. 
and then also for those resources you usually have so resource types that are used uh, you will usually have some profile that indicates some differences on top of the fire specification so uh, uh, let me just see if I can quickly pull up the the guides uh, registry Okay, there we go. So uh, the US core guide, for example, right? Uh, you see this US core guide, there's a lot of documentation. I will not go over that. You can dive into that yourself. But you can see these fire artifacts here in the menu. And you can see they have some profiles. So let's click on that. And then you see this list of resource types here that, you, uh, that are in focus for US Core, the more administrative type of resources, etc. Um, and we've pulled up patient before, so let me do that again. There's a US Core patient. And if you look at the structure that is here, uh, at the table, you can see it looks a little bit different from what we've saw, seen on the FIRE website. Uh, it starts with these green icons here. Those are all extensions. Extensions for mostly uh, relevant to the US. But also, look at the identifier field there. It says one to star. Now, uh, I don't know how hard you looked at the patient from the fire core, but all of the fields for the fire core patient are zero as ma minimum cardinality. So identifier would be zero to star in the fire core. Here they said, no, 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 it's not optional for us. We want at least one identifier. So those kind of differences you can see. It cannot go against the fire core specification though. So we only have more restrictions rather than adding extra fields with their own field names, etc. We cannot go against the core. Everything has to be valid against the fire core specification. Okay, good question. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone. I hope you have a really good dev days. See you later.